Here's a circuit diagram that we found in the Mullard Circuits for Audio Amplifier book, which is available up on our eBay website page for £2.95 for the scanned copy. Uh, we've got now Phil Moss, the service technician, who's going to take you through the circuit diagram. Right, the Mullard 5 valve 10 watt amplifier, mostly known as the 510, just as the 3 valve 3 watt is generally known as the 3.3. These were produced in the book, I've referred to it. They're intended for hobbyists to build and they had a high reputation. I know someone who built the uh, Mallard 3.3, the EL33 version and said it was superb. Of course, it depends on the quality of the output transformer. It is always with these things, it's the quality of the output transformer and how carefully you build them because um, if you get very good components and make the mess that some people make of building things at home and they don't realize, although well, it's obviously hideously ugly and nothing like anything they've ever seen professionally built, and then they think, oh, the design doesn't work well. Yes, the design works very well, providing you do a good job. So anyway, getting back to this one. Um, this is a push-pull amplifier, as I hope by now you can see. So you have got three and a third times the power of the previous amplifier. Frankly, in acoustic terms, that isn't really a very big change. You do, however, get the cancellation of um, even harmonics, as has previously been explained in theory, by using push-pull. They are cancelled in the output transformer. Again, there are two versions of this amplifier, with controls and without. The circuit here is, as with the 3.3, shown with the tone controls and volume control. So this is a complete amplifier, providing you've got a reasonably high input here. If you want to use low-level um, input, such as microphone, tape head, or magnetic cartridge, in the modern sense of a magnetic cartridge, then you will have to have a preamp and there is facility for the supply shown up here and also in this one they show a separate one for an FM tuner. So we get our input and again we have a tone control here, we have a little bit of boost here through the 33 PF and the 680 looks rather like a short circuit at treble frequencies. We have a high resistance treble control here, which does not load the circuit at middle and bass frequencies. The full range signal is fed in through a 1.5 meg into another 2 meg pot with 150k at the bottom end. Now, in this part of the circuit, treble is short circuited from end to, this, um, to the slider sorry, of the pot and short circuited down to that 150k. So what you're left with is low frequencies across the base pot. That is the boost end, that is the cut end, where you have a division of 2 million to 150,000. The output, perhaps slightly confusingly, is then taken from the middle here, the slider of the two controls goes up and there's your volume control on the control grid. It doesn't say log, but that is a one meg log pot. So you've got an EF86, not surprisingly, and it is pentode connected. They're often used triode connected when they're better than other triodes because of their anti-microphonic and low hum heater characteristics. In the cathode, we have one K8 and 100 microfarads, that's the conventional bias. And we have the 100 ohms, which is used as a potential divider in the feedback circuit, but I'll come back to that when I've got to the output. So we go to 120K, which is actually quite low as an anode load for an EF86, it could be much higher. In the 3.3, of course, we had the exceptionally high value of one mega ohm. But as this is driving a grid leak on the other side, um, this had to be at most a third of the value of that. Well, in fact, they've gone far beyond that with that being a meg. 
The screen grid is fed by a 470k resistor. Um, that's a reasonable ratio to the anode load, but it isn't chosen to be the um, maximum signal to noise ratio, in which case that would be up to 10 times the anode load. But this is intended for a fairly high input, as I said before, either from a preamp or from a ceramic pickup, something like that. So it then feeds one of many designs of phase splitter. So the signal is applied to the first grid and the grid leak goes across here. The 0.1 and the 1 mega means that basically no signal appears at this control grid. You can regard this as a smoothing circuit. We have a direct connection from the anode here, so there's positive volts there. There is also a DC path, as there must always be, from these grids, but in this case it's to the HT line, not to Earth. So the signal appears here, is amplified, is, and appears at this anode. There's a 100K anode load resistor, and that goes up to decoupled HT through that 33K and that 8 microfarad. The input stage has 150k decoupling and 8 microfarads of its own, so it's thoroughly decoupled. And that feeds one of the output valves, 820k grid leak, all very conventional. So how does this phase splitter work when you have filtered DC only on the second grid? Well the answer is when you look at this, there's 68k in the cathode, so a high positive voltage here, which is why you can directly connect from the previous anode. The voltage on the cathode will be higher than the voltage on the grid, so there is negative bias. Now, because this is a high resistance, a considerable AC voltage is developed across it and fed to this cathode. So the input voltage to the second valve is not applied to the grid, it's applied to the cathode. That means that the phase at the anode is the opposite way round to what it would be if the signal was applied to the grid. So this inverts the phase, so this is an inverted version of the voltage appearing here. 100k again, Seeing the gain on this side is slightly lower than on this side, I would have expected this resistor to have actually been a bit higher than that one. And if you look at later versions of what is known as a floating paraphase phase splitter, you will find that's 91k and that's 100k. But anyway, the inverted signal is then fed through the point one, as with the other valves, same value of grid leak as one would expect. Both valves have a small grid stopper, goes to the control grid of the output valve. Nothing really to comment on that. The valves, as is correct, have separate bias resistors and they have a bypass capacitor. Now, you have to read the text to work out why they have different values here. The values are actually given down here, but basically, again, for flexibility, they're giving you the choice of several output transformers. That will be expanded in the text that goes with the circuit diagram, but you need to change the impedance of the valve to match the impedance of the output transformer. Normally, one chooses the transformer um, to be optimum for the output valve, but as I say, for flexibility, they've given you a way around it. So it might be 270 ohms or 437, which is a very awkward value to come by. Um, 430 ohms is the closest preferred value. Um, but as they need to be a couple of watts, I imagine, you might have considerable difficulty getting that. But anyway, that is why they give you a choice there. It's pentode connected, they've just got 47 ohms as screen grid stopper resistors, that's about stability. Heavily decoupled by a 50 microfarad capacitor and a 1.2k resistor. The anode supply 
is across another 50 microfarads and comes straight off the cathode of the rectifier, as is um, fairly typical. If you were building this, I would suggest that actually you find yourself a choke and smooth the HT with a choke and add another smaller reservoir capacitor. You might well nowadays build this as a stereo amplifier, so you need twice the current rating of the transformer. An easier that 81 will actually power a stereo amplifier. It's generous for this one. An EZ80 there would work pretty well. They've given us the luxury of fusing the HT line as well as fuses in both sides of the mains. Now, I think you'll find that, strictly speaking, fusing the neutral nowadays is deemed to be illegal. What you do at home, of course, does not have to comply with the law but it's probably a bad idea to do that. When this was designed, uh, uh, many people would probably have used a two pin plug, which are reversible. Many of you are probably too young to know about them, but we used to have two pin plugs and then several versions of three pin and they didn't have fuses in them. The fuse was on the end of the spur and the fuse would have been rated at quite a high current. Nowadays, you could actually dispose of those if you're using a fixed mains lead and use a fuse, preferably of one amp, though they're hard to come by. Two amps, so at the maximum three amps in your modern square pin plug. So the feedback, as with the 3.3, they have put in a 1K across the output. This is unusual. I cannot think of another amplifier which does that. I remember modifying a guitar amplifier many years ago because particularly people with guitars, if they don't get any sound, they turn all the volumes up and they do that to their guitar and you get a huge transient voltage and bango something. Um, and I found that the resistor about 20 times the speaker load was adequate to prevent flashover. Not good for the insulation, but it was adequate to prevent flashover. But they've got a much higher value, but I'm sure that they researched it, knew what they were doing. We then get negative feedback applied via these two components to the cathode of the input valve. Now, again, as with the 3.3, but they've done it the opposite way. With the 3.3, they varied the value of this resistor according to the output impedance. In this one, it's the series resistor, and that's actually the more typical way. This is a phase correction capacitor, and that has to be changed to be the right ratio with the feedback resistor to prevent instability. And they did also obviously encounter a little bit of instability, or planning that this amplifier may be built with not the best quality of output transformer, They've also added a bit of stabilization here in the form of the 330 PF in series with 10K. The actual values of the feedback components are shown up here in this box. Now, again, depending on whether you use the two, the three valve or the mixer um, as the input device, if you're not using a low level, uh, sorry, a high enough level input signal, such as a ceramic cartridge, they give you the required value of that resistor for the right HT voltage. They have a design for an FM tuner, and they are the decoupling components, and it's very heavily decoupled actually, to feed the FM tuner. Now I mentioned the quality of the output transformer. I measured this before. There are two vital characteristics apart from getting the correct impedance ratio, but more important than that probably, you have a, must have enough inductance or it will distort at low frequency because the inductance of the transformer's primary begins to look like a load impedance. Ideally, the Reactance of this at the lowest audio frequency will be several times the anode load impedance of the valve. And the other thing, as I've also previously mentioned, is leakage inductance. Leakage inductance is a damn nuisance. It causes instability. That is why one has to stabilize it with these components. The phase shift within this circuit is very, very small 
particularly if it's well built and there's not much stray capacitance to shift the phase and high frequency. But it is the inductance here. And you might think a few millihenries, why does that matter if the transformer has a minimum inductance? I'd have thought that they would specify 25 henries, preferably 100. Um, it may be a huge ratio, but the phase shift caused by the leakage inductance, which is not coupled into the secondary, does cause a very significant phase shift at high frequency. So going to the input end again, um, fairly conventional transformer. Again, as with the 3.3, they have a separate winding for the heater on the rectifier. Again, the EZ81, like the EZ80, is rated for use with a common heater rail, but again, it is good practice to use a separate one so you don't stress the insulation within the valve. And again, they have sent attack the two 6.3 volt winding, so they're 3.150, 3.15. They've got a separate one, perhaps unusually, for the FM tuner, which is not particularly sensitive to hum, because the hum will be induced into what are mainly RF valves. But anyway, they have seen fit to do that might make it a bit more difficult to find a transformer of that specification. Although I suspect a number of manufacturers, as soon as these circuits came out from Mallard, decided that they would wind transformers for them, especially in the expectation that a lot of enthusiasts would rush out and build this amplifier. And I imagine that a lot of them, if they built them properly, were very pleased indeed with their handiwork. Um, I think that it is, that is it. For the Mallard 510. If you found this tutorial very useful and would like to see more then please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Patreon, Facebook and Twitter accounts. So far to date we have covered dozens of vintage valve amplifiers and equipment starting with basic items such as Danset, Bush and Philips record players. We've also covered the Mallard 33 and the 510 valve amplifiers the mic amp and mixer circuit based around the EF86, the Hacker and Dynatron record players, uh, Leak TL10, Quad valve amplifiers, GEC MOV division, Radford, Pi, Dynaco Stereo 70 and many other British and foreign audio circuits. We are in the process of shooting lots more videos on a regular basis and we will be uploading often. We cover hi-fi, musicians and recording studio equipment as well as vintage radio circuits. Please go to the website for more details.